we are hearing from uh, two sets of folks today. Uh, from um, Peter first, Peter Sterling, and um, Donna Sutton Fay. Uh, I think are just going to give us sort of a general get to know you. What is the Vermont campaign for health care security? Right. Okay. Um, and then secondly, we'll hear from David Reynolds and Craig Stevens from JSI about um, the workforce strategic plan, which will be coming our way sometime in the future. Um, I don't have any other announcements, I don't think. There are no board meetings next week. There are no board meetings next week. Um, anything else? Okay, thanks. So um, we have minutes of April 12th and April 17th provided to us by Sam. Move to approve the minutes of April 12th and April 17th. You have a second? Second. Could, could I suggest one addition to the um, April 12th minutes? And I apologize, I didn't catch this before. Of course. Under new business, um, add a sentence to the first paragraph there that says that the board passed a motion adopting the expedited rule. Good point. Anybody object to that? No. Is that a friendly no. amendment? So amended. <laughs> all right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Thanks. Um, so we are going to go to Peter and Donna first. Um, and you guys can just pull a second chair up here if you want. And, uh, and that's not your thing. So ignore the screen for the moment. And uh, so welcome. Thank you. And before we even get to our introduction, I, I just wanted to say how grateful I am that there's actually an entity this time around called the Green Mountain Care Board, which we did not have when we were trying to do reform in 2005, 2006. And I really believe we could have gotten a lot farther for that first, that initial reform effort if we had folks like you all giving your time and your expertise and listening to the public to actually move us farther than we ended up getting. Not that what we achieved wasn't significant we have on health and other reforms, but the kind of work you all are doing, I think, is, is absolutely fundamental to getting where we want to go with healthcare reform. So if you, when you're getting bored and you're like, why am I dragging myself out to all these meetings bored. and, you know, <laughs> driving, you know, well, you know, do a lot of driving, just remember that I think for a lot of us, this is really important that these meetings are happening and that you're taking this kind of public input. So thank you for your public service on that. Thanks. Um, my name's Peter Sterling and uh, I'm the executive director of the Vermont Campaign for Healthcare Security and I'll let Donna introduce herself. We founded our organization in 2007 after the passage of the law that created Catamount Health, in part because once Catamount Health was created, our biggest concern was nobody was going to enroll, which would really endanger the future of health care reform. Before Catamount Health was passed, half the uninsured were eligible for a public health care program, and after Catamount Health passed, there's still about half the uninsured are eligible for a public health care program. I come at this from a, a grassroots organizer perspective. I've been doing community organizing for about 16 years in Vermont on a bunch of different issues. I also did, I was also Bernie Sanders campaign manager, which entailed a lot of grassroots organizing. And my educational background is actually in forestry. I went to graduate school for forestry, <laughs> so you can see how well that's paying off. But I do, as I said, come at all of this work that I'm doing as a pub for, on public and education. And you can see group. the forest and the trees. Please don't. <laughs> <see that. laughs> Boy, yeah, I can't keep talking. <laughs> I, I thought it was going to yeah. be some comment about the amount of paper that he produces. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm basically a grassroots organizer disguised as an executive director. I'm Donna Sutton Fay. Um, I've been a healthcare advocate for a number of years and um, an advocate in general for a long time. Um, I have been with the campaign for about five years. We heard out of the state of for about eight years. And I worked at Vermont Legal Aid um, for about 15 years before I became the state healthcare ombudsman. So I've been doing healthcare advocacy. Um, <coughs> for a long time. And as I said, we started in 2007, and the goal was to suppl supplant, supplement the outreach enrollment work the state was doing, or quite frankly, that I, a lot of us did not believe the state was going to be able to do after the outreach and enrollment of Catamount Health. And what we really wanted to do, especially, particularly to, to deal with the issue of the uninsured, was go out into the field and find them. You know, Healthcare Ombudsman does a lot of great work receiving calls, a lot of other people organizations do great work when people come to them, but I felt it was important to go out to employers, find where the uninsured were working, go find the uninsured through various groups they interact with. So we hired six, I hired six field staff 
Um, we had them on board for two or three years, and now we have slightly less staff. But in we've I've raised and spent about eight hundred fifty thousand dollars since two thousand seven doing this public education and outreach work to help people get into public health care programs, along with Donna and, and other field staff. And uh, she can talk to you a little while. Yeah, so we've gone about the outreach and education, um, you know which we started in 2007 in a variety of ways. Um, we have a toll-free um, helpline number which people can call and get information about the state health care programs, get help um, enrolling, get general information. Um, we have a really comprehensive website which gives detailed information about Catamount Health, BHAP, and Dr. Dinosaur um, with eligibility requirements, what the premiums are based on your income. People can email us from directly from the website, so we respond to emails um, that way. We um, developed um, literature, which is sort of a quick snapshot of the information on the website, which we've um, distributed, you know, all over the state, which gives that same sort of basic information. Um, and so we get about. Um, probably 100 to 300 calls a month on the hotline, um, which I primarily respond to with um, Peter. We get 150 hits a day to the website, which is when Peter told me that was the number, I said, do you mean a month? And he said, no, I mean a day. Um, so people going 150 times a day looking at the information on the website. Um, we have probably handed out 30,000 pieces of the literature, which I thought I had with me, but I left in my bag, um, which we mail out to people with applications, we give out uh, presentations which we send around to places to just keep on display like the uninsured clinics, providers offices, community action agencies, all, you know, community and nonprofit um, groups. And we also really focused our outreach, um, it was really community based, the field staff were located, you know, sort of in communities around the state and over time that shifted some to focus on areas where maybe we hadn't focused, geographic areas where we hadn't focused initially. And we didn't wait for people who were uninsured to come to us. We tried to work with groups in the community, um, you know, other nonprofits, providers, um, with them as a way to connect with people and go to where people were rather than just waiting for them to call us or, or um, emails. And I think that was really successful. And we would do presentations, you know, all over the state to all kinds of groups, including groups like Rotaries and, you know, I went to a couple of Grange meetings and, you know, just every sort of um, outlet we could think of where we could connect with people. Um, so we probably have, you know, met with, you know, probably nine or 10,000 people around the state doing these presentations, which we continue, you know, to do. We don't do them as, as much as we did initially. Um, and also part of our outreach and education was to train other people in communities to be able to do, to talk to people about with the, the state health care programs and, and help them get enrolled. So we would do training for like clinic, uninsured clinic staff, for <coughs> providers. We did training for state staff and district offices because we found state staff were actually calling us about the state health care programs and they didn't know what to do about questions they were getting, so we ended up going around to all the district offices around the state, um, doing training to like, and also to places like Vogue Rehab, Ladies First, Department of Health. Um, and that's really important because probably everybody in the state touches state government at some point, and so it's really important that state government staff, not just sort of Department of Children and Family staff or Hey You staff um, or DIVA staff know about the state programs, but everybody has some understanding. Um, and then I think the last sort of important focus, well not the last, but part of our um, mission and, and focus was to act as a resource. So after we've sort of been going around, you know, trying to train other advocates and other community groups, 
we would try to be there to respond to their questions um, and get them information quickly and accurately so they knew like if something came up they had a place to call and if we didn't know the answer we would get in touch with you know staff at DIVA or DCF and, and get answers for people so that was the other sort of important piece to the outreach and education which we started doing that and continue to do now and I, I just want to add that most of our work was done in close coordination with DIVA we weren't out there on our own we did our own stuff but we were always coordinating with DIVA to go to rapid responses when there were layoffs and other things so that was that was useful so the meat of, of what we've learned and, and I think this is the reason I was excited to come talk to you all we were is that you basically are in the process of creating two new systems right one for the exchange and one for potentially Green Mountain Care and so what have we learned that maybe we could help you that help 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 impart to you that would help you as you create these new t systems first is I think it's important we can actually get people enrolled in these programs people are, are okay with enrolling in public health care programs. Forgive me if you, you know some of this stuff I'm going to say, but we now have 40 more thousand people on a public health care program than we did when the Catamount reform started in July 07. There were 116,000 people back in July 07. There's 156,000 people on now. That doesn't include churn. That's just 40,000 more people. You know, the real problem we have is keeping them on the program. And I've handed out a chart with all those colors. And, the, you don't have to digest it, but the point, and this is a chart from Steve Capel, it just shows you how much people at low and middle incomes, their income goes up and down, that they're going on and off various programs, whether it's VHAP, Catamount Health with premium assistance, full price Catamount, Dr. Dinosaur, et cetera. There's almost no one on there who's got one solid line. That's a random sampling of a whole bunch of people on these programs. There's almost no one who's got one color. Each line. Is, is an individual and so if you look across it shows you whether the person for example the top line they started on healthy Vermonters then they switched to uh, catamount then they went bare for a while uh, and they stayed bare it looks like or maybe and, and I want to say that that chart is entirely borne out the what we've also gleaned from our interactions with people on the Holland at presentations people at low and middle incomes I mean under 300 percent of poverty have very fluctuating incomes much more so than someone who let's say is at earning in the I don't know ninety thousand dollar range so what income. does this universe represent here that represents a random sampling of I don't know, 50 or 60 people on public health care programs okay. Capel just pulled them out and if and you're really cool you can have this on a t-shirt <laughs> is there an extra copy of that that I could put on camera? Uh, you can use cons for a sec. Thank you. I can give mine to con. Well, let's just count ourselves among the elite few in Vermont that think the topic of churn is cool. I think it's been wicked cool. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, um, this is amazing. I mean, it just, excuse me, but it just really shows you the lack of a system that we have. We don't have a system. We just have people coming and going. Right. I, I would, and it, they're coming and going for specific reasons, which we will go into. We have a couple more numbers here. Can I, can I ask one more? Is there any, I mean, I realize it's a random sample, so maybe the answer to this it's is no. Person. Is there any yeah, significance one person to the fact that it, it gets redder <laughs> as you, I, I assume time is going this way on the x-axis, you know, the, that, it's, that it gets redder as you move forward in time? You'd have to ask Capel that. He, when he did his testimony on that, he didn't mention that specifically. But Redder is a, is a program name. Yeah. So why people are drifting into one program, we've never been able to ascertain that. Okay. I think that this, uh, I think the answer is that this shows uh, Catamount Startup is in this period, so people oh. didn't have that option, then they yeah. have it. So it's not only Redder, but you see that things are fuller over here. So there was a report that was done, um, in, which Steve Chappelle was part of in September of 2010, um, called the Achieving Universal Coverage Through Comprehensive Reform. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, the Center for Health Policy at the University of New England did it, and Steve was one of the people who worked on it. Um, it has a lot of really important information, but it does look at Catamount Health in particular, and sort of the whole issue of people coming onto Catamount and, and going off. And there were a couple of um, statistics in there that really um, struck me. One is that the report calls sort of staying on Catamount as brief and episodic. That's how it describes people's time um, in Catamount Health. And that the average time that people are actually enrolled is seven to eight months. Um, as 
Blue Cross Blue Shield at some point, um, I'm not sure exactly of the timing of when they did it, but they did an analysis of some of their enrollees that are in Catamount. And they looked at what they called a, a typical enrollment co cohort in their initial month of enrollment, and they sort of followed them over a year. So each month, 4 to 8 percent of that original group dropped off the program. So at the end of the year, only 40 percent of the original group was still on the program, which is pretty amazing, you know, that people are just coming and going as, you know, concept um, on and off all the time. Um, and I, I would like to say that I, even though we're giving you numbers on Catamount Health with premium assistance or CHAP, as some people call it, um, I would expect these numbers to be similar for VHAP enrollees as well. I think Dr. Dinosaur would be different, mm -hmm. but I think just because we're using Catamount doesn't mean we're not thinking that VHAP would be the same. And, but again, I feel this is an important point I'd really like to leave you with. A spe you know, having gone through the outreach and initial and out rollout of Catamount Health, we faced a lot of cynicism that the, the public sector can't do this. It's not going to work. It's going to fail. Why should we even try? And yet, I feel Catamount, for what it's been designed to do, has been very successful. As, as Mark Larson used to say when he was the chair of the Health Care Committee, the legislature did not order a Cadillac. They ordered a bicycle. Okay, it wasn't supposed to be universal health care. It was supposed to be this very moderate thing. And for the bicycle they ordered, it is a great bicycle. We, and one of the examples I use, and forgive me for using confusing language, but it's, for, again, from a report by Steve Capel. The number of people <laughs> from, is he in the room? Sorry, Steve. Well, those of you who know and know it can be a little, you know, you got to read it like six times to figure it out. And he's always right. The number of people who've been on Catamount at some point is nearly equal to the estimated number of those eligible when Catamount was created. So that's about 25,000 people. So in other words, we've touched just about, we've touched most of the people. We've got them in, we've got them educated about the program. They just don't stay in. And so the fact is, we can, not we, the, the public sector can do health care reform. And I, and I feel that's important to say because I'm, I know you all are hearing from a lot of people who doubt whether the, the government can actually do health care reform right. now. I hope this next step, whether it's the exchange degree Mountain Care, is, is what we really need to do. But remember, at the time when Catamount Health was done, there wasn't the political will to do massive reform. I mean, there were some people who wanted, but quite frankly, the governor at the time did not want to go far enough. So I just want to let you know, we think that when you all design something, it can be made to work. And I really want to leave you with that point. So let's get to, I think it's important to get to why we think people turn on and off. I think the. I mean, not just I think. I think uh, you know, studies have shown that affordability is is the main reason or one of the top reasons why people don't stay on programs. Um, the latest survey that Bishka did, um, forgotten actually what the new name of the department Finreg. is. What is it? Finreg. Finreg. Okay. Financing regulations. <laughs> um, the last survey it did of the of the uninsured. Um, when it asked people why aren't why don't you have insurance, 61% said cost was the only reason, and another 18% said it was one of the main reasons. So almost 80% of the people who are uninsured, cost is the reason or one of the main reasons why they don't have insurance. And I, that plays out in the interactions we have with people all the time when people are calling to find out I mean first of all people actually who call us now they know about the health care programs nobody calls anymore and says you know what's catamount or I've never heard of it or it's more like here's my situation does it sound like I'm eligible when, and many people call because they've gone off and now they need to get re-enrolled and not being able to pay their premium was usually the reason given for why they had to go off. They just weren't able to afford it. And people don't look at just the premium amount. They also look at all the other out-of-pocket costs, too. So they ask about the deductible. They ask about the out-of-pocket costs, the co-insurance, the prescription co-payments. And people who are going from VHAP to Catamount are still pretty low income people are really shocked about the difference between VHAP and Catamount when their income might be, you know, $10 a month more or something like that, that they now have gone from no deductible and no co-payments to significantly higher co-payments, and that's a huge issue for people. And 
as, as you're creating the exchange. I, I, you know, I think I think as many of you know when when the industry or the the ref, when people talk about out of pocket costs, that's generally referred to as a copay, coinsurance, or deductible. But I think in the real world, if you were to walk downstairs to the pizza place, people would include premiums in that, right? And so I think when we talk about out of pocket costs, we include premiums because that's how I believe most people, when they're deciding whether to enroll or to stay enrolled, they do that whole back of the envelope addition that. What am I going to pay, and how much? What am I paying monthly, and how much more do I got to pay? And I think even when you, we talk to people about Catamount, which to the rest of all of us seems like an incredible deal. I mean, 120 bucks a month for a thousand dollar out of pocket limit. I mean, you cannot get better than that. But when you're talking about someone at 200 percent of the poverty level, you know, a thousand dollars to be on the hook for you. Well, do I really want to pay my premium? So I think the out of pocket limit is not just a barrier to care. I think it's a barrier to enrollment. So I'd like I, I handed this chart out too, and this is. Capel esque in its confusion, but I just, it, 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 it shows you as you're considering what's going to happen with the exchange, what the out-of-pocket costs are like for people now under VHAP. Well, well, first, that column on the left is what people are earning their gross income. The column in the middle is their current out-of-pocket exposure, which again includes premiums. And then the one the column on the far right is their estimated out-of-pocket cost in the exchange. So let's just look at that first one, an individual who's now on VHAP at 150% of the poverty level is grossing $16,700 a year. And, that, and gross is important there because everybody raised their hand who pays their bills out of their gross income. <laughs> right, it's, they're, they're actually making a lot less than that, right? So right now under VHAP, they'll pay about $396 in premiums a year, plus some minor copays, out-of-pocket costs, about 600 bucks a year. Look at their out-of-pocket exposure under, in the exchange under the federal subsidies, $2,689. And that, pe that, number, that parentheses number, um, percentage number, that's representative of the percentage of gross income where they meet their out-of-pocket limit. So you're talking about someone at that level spending 16% of their income. And as you go down, you know, just look under 250% of the poverty level, that couple who's earning $37,000, grossing thirty-seven grand a year, their out-of-pocket limit, if you go to that far right column, is $6,000 if based now on the federal subsidy. The, uh there's also out-of-pocket subsidies in the exchange, right? This includes that. Oh, wow. Right. So does everyone understand that? And so their total out-of-pocket exposure, in my mind, would be over $9,000, representing if they were to get sick. Now, I understand not everyone reaches their out-of-pocket limit. I don't want to scare people. But if you were, and it's 24% of your income. And, and, and I will fess up. My wife and I are on Catamount with the premium subsidies. And you know the idea of having a $6,000 out-of-pocket exposure for me and my wife is really scary. Were we to get sick, that's a serious problem. Now, we're going to enroll regardless because we feel like we need health insurance and all that. But there's a lot of people who are going to see a $6,000 out of pocket and say, why should I spend $3,000 a year on premiums if me and my wife still have to come up with another $6,000 out of money we don't have to begin with with gas at $4 a gallon and all that other stuff. And so when you're, when you're thinking about how to create the exchange, I really want you to think about an additional, I encourage you to think about an additional state subsidy on top of the federal one to bring down these out-of-pocket limits, not only for the people below 200% of the poverty level, but even above that, if you truly want people to enroll, and then once they're enrolled, to see the doctor. Do you, do you all have any questions about this chart that I could clear up? And for members of the public, there's plenty more back there. Yes? Well, you know, you know in, in terms of the exchange, we, we our statutory responsibility is the benefit, the basic benefit yep. package. So, yep, I know. Yeah. I'm sure though. The financing yep. is certainly to be determined. Yep. Right. I'm sure you guys have some <laughs> pull, even as constituents <laughs> and legislators, with somebody where you this could make the case that a high, to be that on the too record. high out of pocket <laughs> limit would deter people from seeking the care they need. And again, I think you know this, but I, I do bear, I think it's worth repeating, especially as we, we spend a lot of time talking to these people under 300% of the poverty level, but what to many of us seems like a reasonable copay, $10 a month mm -hmm. to a lot of people, you know, is going to be a lot of money if you have to do that three or four times a month. And if you truly want people to get care, I, I, I think you have to really consider carefully the, the, the extent of those out-of-pocket costs. Now, at what point, this must reverse here, right? Some, somehow. Um, you mean the percentages? Yeah. I guess it happens. Yeah, because the exposure. Yeah, it goes yeah. down yeah. above 400% yeah, of the poverty right. level. So if okay. you were earning a million dollars a year, your okay. out of pocket limit's the same as if you were at okay. 400. 401%. 
So yeah, we just all need that much money and then <laughs> this won't be a problem. <laughs> the Buffett rule. Buffett rule, that's right. So in addition to affordability being an issue for people and sort of a main reason why people don't stay um, enrolled in the public programs, barriers to dealing with the system, you know, is a significant issue. And um, could spend a whole meeting probably talking about barriers to enrollment and, and staying enrolled. Um, but one of the key um, issues is probably particularly true in Vermont is it's very difficult for people who are self-employed um, or who have varying income, which is an incredibly high number of people in Vermont, to deal with a system like we have because they don't fit into it neatly. Their income changes week to week, month to month, seasonally. Um, it's very hard to fit into, you know, concrete income guidelines when your income is going up and down, and it might mean you move from program to program. You know, it becomes crazy, and it's very hard for people to deal with. And premiums don't adjust quickly. It could take a month or two. Like if your income went down and your premium was going to go down, that could take a month or two for all of that to play out. In the meantime, you could have dropped off the program because you couldn't afford your premium, and you have to start all over, you know, reapplying. Um, so that, in the other issue for people who are self-employed is the deductions that are allowed from business income for the state programs. First of all, they vary among the programs. They're not the same for all the programs. And they vary from what self-employed people can deduct on their tax returns. So when you tell people, well, this is the income limit for you know your family of four, just saying look at your income tax return won't necessarily let them know if they're eligible. Depreciation is the big issue. Depreciation is not an allowed business expense for Catamount Health or VHAP. It keeps many, many self-employed people off those programs. It is allowed for Dr. Dinosaur. So we have a system where the kids in the same family can be eligible and enrolled in Dr. Dinosaur, but the parents are not eligible for VHAP or Catamount because depreciation is not an allowed deduction from their business income. So all of these kind of crazy rules that make no sense to any person out, you know, lay person out there applying for programs, keep them off um, programs or going on and off um, continually. Um, one of the things we found that was sort of a missing gap in the outreach that happened around Catamount was outreach to the business community particularly to small businesses where many people work for employers who don't offer insurance um, or who might offer insurance but people the employees might still be eligible for a state program that was a whole missing piece of outreach which really hopefully we can do better this time around so people employees and employers understand what the programs are what the benefit to employees and employers are of going into the exchange or availing themselves of the federal subsidies and whatever, but that's a, a huge piece to get at people who are uninsured is through their employers. Um, they're, they're there, they're located there, you can talk to them. We found this out when we did rapid response uh, meetings with the state when unfortunately the people were being laid off, but it was, you would go and there sometimes would be 15 or 20 employees who were losing their jobs. You could talk to them all at once about their what the programs are their eligibility help them you know start the enrollment process that would not have happened if the employer said well and here's a toll-free number just call this number and <coughs> someone will help you and, and I think I think for those of us who've worked with people in poverty I think many some of you may know this but people in poverty particularly we tend to retreat into silos once we lose them from their place of employment it's very hard to find them again. It's not like a lot of other people who have time to go to meetings or involved in civic groups. You know, if you're working two jobs, your ability to participate in an evening meeting or go somewhere else is, is, is curtailed if you don't have money for gas, all that kind of stuff. So it was very important for us particularly to try to find low-income workers, you know, someone who works for a Burger King at their place of <coughs> employment. Because once they get laid off, you know, it's going to be hard to find them and get them the information they need. And the other piece which I alluded to before, which I would highlight again, is it's really critical for state agencies and staff to understand the programs and at least know who to call. I mean, it's really, 
I worked, you know, never worked for state government, but I worked with state government for a long time. It was incredible to me that staff workers in district offices would call us because they didn't know who to call about an enrollment problem. Like they didn't even know about member services or what the number was. I mean, that was incredible to say nothing about like the details of the programs. And I don't for a minute underestimate how hard it is for someone working in a district state office to understand all the healthcare programs, the you know, food stamps program, the fuel assistance program. I know how hard all that is, but I just think it's critically important to that that piece be, that hole be, you know, fixed this time around. And, and it wasn't an institutional barrier like you may have where someone at Diva was so mad at someone at AHS that they couldn't handle talking to each other. There was simply, it was no one's job. So we did it catch as catch can, but it's not like it's an impossible thing to achieve. It was a staffing issue. And if it was properly staffed, you could have someone doing all this good work to so those people who are on the front lines talking to the uninsured or underinsured or people in a uh, training program to get them enrolled. Um, so here's something that's actually relevant, maybe to your uh, statutory purview, <laughs> about, about the benefit package of public health care programs. So as Donna said, we've talked to thousands and thousands of people. And I can honestly say we have not heard a single person complain that the benefit package of the public health care program they're in does not meet their needs. There has been no one who's basically, in short, disenrolled from Dr. Dinosaur, Catamount VHAP, whatever, because they didn't think the benefit package was good. They enroll for other reasons, but the benefit package works. And that, to me, is great. The only thing I would add as you think this thing through, what we consistently hear about over and over from adults on Catamount and VHAP is their lack of access to oral health care. And if I could just give a visual here, it almost makes no sense that as a po from a policy point of view to ensure every, I do this in public presentations, so don't worry, nothing bad. <laughs> <laughs> to ensure every single part of you, yeah, right, yeah, right? Every part of us is insured, except this very expensive hole in our mouth. And when you're talking to someone on Catamount or VHAP who's got low, very little income, and they are faced with a problem in their mouth, it is, it is really, really scary for them. And I gotta tell you, right, honestly, for my wife and my, me, I mean, a major dental problem is a major, major setback Right? I mean, I could have anything else happen to me, I'm going to be taken care of. But man, something happens to my mouth, and where do we come up with that money? And so I'd like you to, I know it's not in, it's not supposed to be part of the essential benefit package in the exchange, and of course Green Mountain Care, the benefit package is up in the air, but some kind of basic preventative benefit for adults, even if the state has to pay for it in the exchange, would go so far for so many people. And uh, it would really, it would really mean a lot. So, in Alan's, summary, Alan's I'll touch. Do you want me to do that part again I, where I point my mouth? <laughs> I hope not. Um, I, I would pay you not to. Um, uh, I'm willing to work with you on this. Um, but the numbers that I have in the charts that I've seen from the ACA don't match the numbers on your sheet. Okay. Now, that's totally possible because this is the single most confusing, you know, 2,000 page bill that, you know, mm -hmm. imaginable. But I. I'd like to get to the bottom of where yeah. you're, what you're looking at versus what yeah. I have in my incredibly complicated phone. Well, um, ha we're having but I don't want to do it right here and well, right now and bore everybody to death. Like said, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to yeah. be casual about this, but I can assure you we have gone over these numbers and Robin Lunch has gone over these numbers as Look, well. I'm looking at hers right now. I actually just changed the chart to, I mean, because okay. when I did the calculations yeah. for the premiums, it was a little different than her, so I just changed it to her. We won't drag numbers. everyone through yeah. this, but Don will get in touch with you and wa walk you through your phone, what's on your phone. Yeah. But, um. I could just have my phone call your phone. And <laughs> I don't have a phone <laughs> like that, but oh. I have a regular phone. Yeah. <laughs> we don't pay that well where we get those fancy phones. <laughs> um, so in, in, to sum up, what I think a lot about is, is fairness. and. and and what, you know, we are committed to seeing that everybody gets access to affordable health care. We've never, you know, our organization's never cared whether it's single payer or something, as long as everyone had access to it. And generally, we felt that that was going to happen through some kind of public initiative. But if, if it was going to come through the private market, you know, so be it. But in general, we want to see you all create a system that, that works for people. And one of the things that we get most that undermines people's faith in the process and faith in actual public health care is when they're not treated fairly such as an enrollment, like a, a subsidy cliff. Like cat, the, the price difference between Catamount at 300% and 301% is $300. So someone making 29 grand is paying 200 bucks. Someone making 33,000 is paying 450. 
you can see why people, when you, exp we understand why that has to happen. When we have to explain that to someone on the phone, they get very, very upset. The one year waiting period for Catamount and VHAP, you cannot make people understand why that has to, has to be. We understand, I don't agree with it, but as a po there's a policy there in place. But when you explain to people whose employer just dropped their insurance, and this person did nothing wrong, but now they have to wait a year to get on Catamount or VHAP, they get very, very upset. Now, I'm not, I understand you all had nothing to do with that, but as you move forward creating these new systems, I encourage you to avoid putting things into the new systems that create the perception of unfairness. And one that jumps out to my mind as going to be a problem is the fact that the exchange has an open enrollment period. And in the first year, that open enrollment period is going to end on March 31st, meaning if you're an individual, you just didn't have a qualifying exception, let's say you drove a snowplow, didn't snow that way, you don't have any money, you get money you know, in April, you want to enroll, you cannot enroll till January 1 of 2015. Now, we understand why that has to happen, so people don't pay premiums and they pay, and we get that, but your regular person is going to freak out mm -hmm. and see the system as unfair, and that's going to undermine our ability to move ultimately where we want to go, and I understand you have limited purview over things like that. I'm not trying to get you to change. I'm just trying to encourage you to think about all of these things that create the perception of unfairness, such as depreciation not counting. So a farmer's kid gets into Dr. Dinosaur, but the farmer can't get into CHAP. The waiting period, the open enrollment period, you know, as you are building this whole, you know, building this whole new system or systems, think about what, how the public perceives fairness and what that does to undermine their support for the reforms we want. Did I get it all in? Okay. So I just want to tell you, David, since you're up next, this fan's blowing about 120 degree air here. So this is literally the hot seat. This is literally the hot seat, not just their questions. I'm sweating because of this. So, so I'll ha Al, I'll have Donna follow up to you about our, our, mis our mysterious chart. And I well, want to well I just think it's important yeah. that, you know, like if somebody isn't making any money and they put that in on the exchange, then that would affect what they pay. And in fact, they will be paying zero. And so, it's like zero to two percent. So the point is that mm -hmm. there's a there's a mecha, there's a mechanism in there to adjust for those type of issues. The question is, will it work properly? Not right. And just right. to be clear, in the exchange, people under 133 percent, the people you're referring to, are in Medicaid, and they'll have no premium. Well, well no. What I was trying to say is that if you drop down to the bottom part of the exchange, like you you were to lose a snowplow account, yeah. like you're, in your example, right, and you were to go down to the lowest part of the exchange. You're at zero to two percent, and that's, I mean, that's in Robin's chart. You're not in the exchange, though. You're in Medicaid in that situation. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're right about that, but we, we, can, you're we can match up. Okay. If you're under 133 percent of poverty level, you go into Medicaid, which is technically not part of the exchange. And the t I, maybe one of the reasons the chart is confusing is the, like, for example, the 200 percent, that's the premium amounts in the out-of-pocket, that's for someone up to 200 and up to and including 200 percent so someone who might be at a hundred and um, 75 percent they their premium will be a little bit lower than this because it is a percentage of income right right I, I just think the point is that you're yeah. if you're not making any money the theory that you are then going to sign up for something I mean you would you already would have signed up if you, if you can I mean you can get in at, at zero Okay. I hear you. Yeah. <coughs> Peter or Donna, yeah, in terms of barriers, tell, tell me what your experience has been just in terms of people responding, I can't get, I can't find a doctor who will take this insurance, or I can't find a doctor who has an open practice, or it's easier for me to go to the emergency room, yeah. I'm just going to, I'm going to go to the emergency room. We actually don't hear that, you but I don't that. think we would hear that, because I think the healthcare ombudsman office would hear that more. Yeah. People don't, and that's not really what we do. I and mean, people will say, what doctors can I see? Yeah. Um, and so we'll explain how you figure that out. Um, but they don't actually come to us and say, well, I can't find anyone who will either take BHAP or Dr. Dinosaur or Catamount. So, because that's just generally not the types of calls that we get. Right. And, and then in your 150, was it 150 hits a day or, or, or your calls has, has has there been any uh, indication that the people that are thinking about VHAP or Catamount also are aware that there's another health care reform process going on? Very, very. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, I think uh, some people know that the governor's proposing something. 
that's it. But the, I'd say the, the level of understanding of the exchange is just about zero. I've talked to a few people who express concern about the current system and is this ever going to get better? So I use that as an opportunity to say, yes, we expect it will be getting considerably better. But most people, I don't think, or they have huge misconceptions about what might be happening. But, but very few people seem to really have any understanding or even expressed awareness. They might not, they might and not express it to us, but they don't bring that up when they're calling. So knowing how important what you do in the education of people about access to a state where we've had great, uh, great programs in place for a long time to keep the uninsured numbers low, how have you, how do you raise the money that you need to do your work at $850,000? Is that philanthropic? How, where does that money come from? It came from uh, foundations. Foundations. Mostly national foundations who were very interested in having states be laboratories for reform because they saw federal health care legislation coming and they were very eager to fund the work we were doing in Vermont. I'm a good beggar, too. <laughs> so I have a, an observation and a, and a question. Um, the observation just has to do with your point about fairness, um, and I think that's a real conundrum a lot of times when we try to develop sort of piecemeal policy that is somehow fair. I develop, I came up with this saying at the end of my last round of health reform in Vermont, if it's cheap, it's not fair, and if it's fair, it's not cheap. Meaning if you make it totally fair, you usually do so in an additive manner. You know, you fill this hole, you fill that hole so that everybody is treated as well as the person who has the best deal, because otherwise you're taking something away. Um, so I totally agree with you that those cliffs and similarly situated people being treated differently um, are things that are really problematic. But it's also very problematic to make it all right in, a, in the kind of system, the cockamamie system we have. Um, so that's my observation. My question is actually for Donna. Um, and this is somewhat off the subject that you came here to talk with us about, but, but because of your experience being the ombudsman. Um, we have been talking about representation of the public in our process, um, and the legislature has been talking about it as well. <coughs> what's the best way to achieve that. Right now, uh, the best method that we have is to include the ombudsman in certain ways um, and to have that be formal and required. Um, but do you have any thoughts about whether that is adequate or what you think is the best model for making sure there's sort of expert ongoing representation of the public in our processes. I do think using the healthcare ombudsman is the best way to do it. Um, I think it's adequate if the program is adequately funded. Um, when I was there, I would not have had, I mean, the expertise to do like rate review analysis. I would have needed to have had funding to be able to get someone who could who had that expertise, who could advise me or, you know, help do it. Um, Did you ever hire out for that kind of expertise on any issues? No. I, when I was there, um, for this is quite a long time ago, Blue Cross Blue Shield wanted to reorganize as a for-profit holding company. I thought, I knew nothing. I didn't even understand the language about, but I worked with Community Catalyst, which helped us at no cost and so we got access to the experts that they had or that they had access to and so they found someone who actually could look at a rate filing and explain it in language to someone who doesn't understand it. Um, had that um, expertise not been available for free it just wouldn't have had it. I mean, it wasn't anything we had funding for or had any hope of getting funding for. My experience when I would try to get additional money from the legislature, it was very, very difficult. And I never tried to get it for funding for experts. I tried to get it for basic staff to answer people who were calling in with problems with their health insurance. And it was extremely difficult. And I don't you know, I mean, I know the people who work there now. I don't think it's any better, and it's probably even harder. So I do think the Ombudsman Office is the best vehicle, but I think it's critically important that they be funded in a way in which they can actually carry out 
you know, sort of the work that they need to do in representing the public. Thanks. Yeah, you, uh, at one point you mentioned um, 40,000 more people having some kind of coverage. Um, where does that come from? It comes from uh, the Green Mountain Care Enrollment Report put out by AHS. So okay. I, I could give it to you. Um. And it's public health care, so Catamount, premium assistance, VHAP, Dr. Dinosaur, Medicaid. So it, it doesn't include commercial? Correct. So some of that 40,000 may have come from the commercial side? No, no. This is just an increase in the, in the public health care programs. You mean people may have dropped off of commercial That's right. coverage? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, most certainly. Um, okay. The only thing that would show that would be the household health insurance survey, which um, was the last one. I, I just used that number to highlight the fact that public health care programs are useful. It fills a need for people. And I understand. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. Um, I, I, I was just concerned that I was hearing that there were 40,000 more total. Oh, oh no. Um, no, not at all. We're not hearing that. Okay. No, we, the uninsured rate's just about the same about as same. it was. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Good time. All right. Craig, David, take the and I chair. assume that is Craig. Yeah. <laughs> Here, Craig. Here, <laughs> Craig. <laughs> We're better at the administrative duties anyway. <laughs> take the comfortable chair. There you go. <laughs> Do you want to stretch or anything? Does anybody want to sit with any stretch? How long are you going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I have copies of the PowerPoint if anyone wants one. That'd be great. All right, cool. you have that would be they they have have oh, already. we have them. Never mind. Put some back there for the other one. When he said he was waiting for Craig, I was like, man, this is awful thin to be from Craig. <laughs> oh, <laughs> other Craig Jones, yeah. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, that okay. would have to be. If Kel to the Capel is hard to that. understand, Craig is thick. <laughs> <laughs> So I am uh, David Reynolds. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Healthcare Administration in what was Bishka, and now I've heard referred to as DFR, and FINREG, and DIFFER, and <laughs> DEFER. I like that one kind of. One. <laughs> and with me is uh, Craig Stevens, and um, I'm going to let him introduce himself later. But we're very fortunate to have his expertise as a consultant on this project, and uh, I think you'll. You'll understand why when he uh, talks about what he's been doing and what he intends to do. So I just want to say, I, I think the wisdom <coughs> of Act 48 is that um, it's not just about coverage. We just heard a lot about that. But that it also incorporates uh, delivery system reform and payment reform and recognizes that to achieve those, we need to plan short term and long term for our workforce needs and in a different way, not the way we've done it in the past. So. Um, and um, uh, the obligation according to Act 48 is that on January 15, 2013, the Director of Health Care Reform shall provide the strategic plan approved by the Green Mountain Care Board to the General Assembly. So that's the end point we're, we're looking at and we'll talk about the time frame to get there. But, um, and so our agenda today is uh, to uh, do these things, uh, give you an overview of uh, what's uh, called for in Act 48, and then introduce how we're going to go about it. Um, and the last thing is uh, Georgia admonished me and Craig not to be boring. So <laughs> that may be harder. We don't allow that in this room. <laughs> and we want to make this you know, as interactive as possible, so at any point just Let's just uh, have a conversation. So. I'm not leaving. I'm just going to get a tissue. No, was it something I said? <laughs> 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 See, you're already boring. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't take long. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to provide some insight into the methodology that uh, we're going to utilize, uh, describe the process and time frame, and then most importantly, uh, get comments and questions and make sure that what we're producing fits into the vision that you may have in this area because the last thing you want to do is end up with a product that isn't useful and um, doesn't really address uh, uh, what, what you need to achieve. So um, I think the interesting thing uh, uh, is the language that's in Act 48 which says a strategic plan which includes recommendations on how to develop 
Vermont's health care workforce. So this isn't just the traditional workforce plan that was, you know, uh, in the past maybe an inventory or a resource catalog. Um, um, it's meant to be more that, than that. It's meant to be a systemic approach to how, how do we develop the workforce we need. So it's not just looking at do we need three more physical therapists in Rutland. <laughs> you know, that, that's not where we're headed. So, um, and the act calls for uh, the establishment of a work group that will uh, uh, be advisory on this and then to develop a plan that um, achieves uh, all of those things. The last item is not really in the um, uh, uh, Act 48, but it was called for in a health department study uh, that was uh, concluded this January, which says, you know, there's a lot of uh, workforce um, efforts out there in state government. Um, uh, some that are specific to a profession, some that are broad-based and include healthcare. So how can we coordinate these in some rational capacity to uh, achieve a, an end result and not be in, in these silos? Um, so where do we uh, stand today as a, uh, this is why it's important, this is early in the, in the process, we want to engage you in this. Um, uh, we are, there, again, uh, in the interest of coordinating and uh, not having to duplicate efforts, there was, uh, as an offshoot of the Workforce Development Council, a Workforce Development Partnership that was really looking at, at uh, health careers and health efforts and uh, workforce efforts. And so a lot of the people that are called for in Act 48 um, were already on that body, so we didn't see a need to create another body that would have a, basically the same membership and call them to two different meetings. So, um, and we approached the partnership and they are very willing to fulfill this role. We're, we're currently analyzing it. We realize we may need to add some, some players um, that will become more apparent as we as we talk about the next item, which is a recognition of the need to address structural and systemic issues, as we talked about. Um, we did develop a, a process and a timeline, and um, again, uh, in the interest of efficiency and non-duplication, we have begun to look at and are utilizing some of the previous and most recent workforce planning efforts. Um, uh, and many of which Craig was involved with, so that's uh, a bonus too. So at that, I'm going to let Craig sure. introduce himself and talk a little bit about his background and what he's been working on in this area and how he's approaching this. Okay. So. Thanks. Uh, so I'll give a very quick background. Craig Stevens, um, my history in Vermont, uh, married a Vermonter, was dragged back here about 16 years ago. Um, everyone is a very good homing pigeon here, which is nice. I've enjoyed that. Um, since that time, I've held positions within state government, the university, and, the, and now within a consulting firm. I've been the director of the AIDS program for the Vermont Department of Health. I was the director of the Office of Rural Health and Primary, I'm sorry, director of, of the Office of Primary Care and concurrent uh, associate director of the Area Health Education Center program, both looking at primary care workforce development. Um, and then also the director of the State Office of Rural Health and Primary Care. Before I took this position, opened up an office for JSI about um, eight years ago. Uh, since that time, I've been involved in healthcare workforce development. A uh, quick primer on JSI, not-for-profit, um, based out of Boston, there's actually seven domestic offices, 26 international. Um, again, a small office here uh, started eight years ago. But um, my first, uh, besides the, the career that I had within the university and the state, um, within JSI, we've worked on the first healthcare workforce plan uh, with an advisory group that eventually became the Workforce Development Partnership. We worked with the New England Rural Health Roundtable to create a regional uh, workforce plan, uh, most recently with AHEC to also create a statewide and update um, the workforce plan. So I think there is a lot of work that's been done um, that does not need to be recreated. I think there's a lot of process that still needs to occur to get people on board. As David said, I think we're talking about some very important, difficult structural issues, and I'll say why we keep looking at structural issues versus programmatic, you know, new programs. Um, so I think process is going to be very important if we're going to be talking about some significant changes. So I just want to uh, touch base, um, you know, what have been our efforts and results in workforce planning to date. You know, there's been a lot of activities by different sectors around Vermont. Um, 
And I think what I want to underscore is that, well, I mean, for example, Area Health Education Center, uh, we've had loan repayment for dentists, physicians, uh, nurses, scholarships, um, uh, rotation of residents in rural areas, training programs by Department of Labor which focus on healthcare workforce. Fletcher Allen has done training programs on critical care nursing. A lot of folks have been involved. Um, and the efforts to date have been successful, I think, in retaining the current status of the workforce. But I don't believe, you know, based on what we're seeing, it's really prepared us for the dramatic changes that are going to be ahead. And I'm pulling up just one piece of data. Again, um, as David said, we don't want to focus on the kind of workforce du jour. We want to look at the system. Um, but this piece of data helps illustrate that, which is from 2000 to 2010, the overall primary care physician to population ratio, that's what the state uses to measure um, physician um, uh, uh, levels has remained steady overall with small decreases in rural areas of the state. Having said that, we've seen a lot of efforts going into programs, AHEC ramping up its work, loan repayment ramping up, and they've done an excellent job of maintaining that status quo, but we really need to be looking at something else that's less of a retaining wall that's going to get us to the level that we need moving forward. So I think, again, this just um, underscores why we need some structural or systemic approaches, perhaps. I wanted to touch on, again, this is not an educational session. You know these things, but I'm trying to underscore, I think, some of the approaches we're thinking of. Um, how is demand changing? We know that our population is aging. Um, we have a very large aging population. Um, increasing chronic disease prevalence, a lot of efforts to um, curve that um, increase and we have health reform and increased access. Um, I'm skipping a lot of the thought presses here, but it's really creating a need for hands-on care providers. We can't keep doing technology, diagnostics, um, and uh, new procedures are not going to take care of the needs that we have. We need a lot more hands-on. Yes, um, yeah, I think there, there was a study recent, uh, Alan, you may know about it, about uh, in the last 30 years or so, there's been a 25-fold increase in administrative positions in healthcare compared to the increase in physicians, for instance, primary okay. care physicians. So. so certainly demands is going to be on um, those hands-on care providers. As an administrator, I didn't mind that. But. <laughs> and I, ICD-10 is supposed to make that worse, right? <laughs> That's what we're told. Um, there will be the need for significant public and private investments to support this as a strategic growth industry. I skipped over this, but with the growth that we're expecting in healthcare, Department of Labor is looking at it as a strategic growth industry. It is uh, an economic engine that we need to be paying attention to. Um, and that is going to require, with healthcare, um, public and private investments. Training people oftentimes this requires... It's funny that uh, like, one part of government's like psyched it's growing and we're supposed to make it shrink. I mean, it's just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're not sure happy right about it or sad about it. No, we want it to grow in the we're right way. Oh. We're trying to leverage <laughs> based on what's going on. Um, and we know that there's a different <laughs> social compact with healthcare providers. We're asking folks to do business differently. And so we need to be prepared to address that. <clears throat> so this is one of my favorite um, mantras uh, that I think is back in the, my days of working with AHEC. Um, where you are from and where you're trained influence where you practice. That's one of the pieces of information that I've always kept with me. And um, basically what that says is, uh, I, actually, uh, I, I don't know uh, where to quote this from, but um, Department of Labor or a staff member from Department of Labor once told me if we're to try to keep up with the demand in healthcare professions, one in four kids that are graduating from Vermont high schools right now needs to choose a health career, some type of health career. Um, and that's a lot of people. And so if the idea is that um, where you are, where you're from, and where you're trained, that seems to be the places for us to focus on these initiatives. And so what does that mean? It means taking a look at some type of education reform activities. Um, you know, throughout pre-K through graduate degree, uh, focusing on secondary education, post-secondary and continuing education program expansion, and trainings and certificate programs. So how are we working to improve the pipeline so that more people choose health careers, more people choose to come to Vermont to train for their health career. And I think this is why as we develop this plan, it's absolutely essential. This can't be just focused on 
on uh, uh, health professions uh, and organizations. It's got to involve the Department of Education, the State, the Department of Labor, and the Department of Health. It all ripples through in terms of what we're trying to achieve in health care reform. Yeah, I think that's what, you know, that's our nervousness of what the difficulties of this are, is mm -hmm. how you coordinate all of those different entities for something that, you know, I think people are struggling with. Um, what you mean we? we <laughs> at least making the, rec the recommendations are the start. That's where the first hatchet drops, right? Well, would it be safe to say then, it, 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 to translate what you just said about one and four, is that healthcare reform is a job engine, and that one out of four new jobs in Vermont may well be in the healthcare sector. Mm -hmm. New jobs, as opposed to technology, as opposed to manufacturing, mm -hmm. one out of four. Yep. I think we'll nail down the statistics mm -hmm. of the Department of Labor, but I think that's a dramatic comment to come from um, and thinking about how do we resolve this. Some of the answers are here, but they're really tough. Um, and also just to note, uh, with those demands, George Washington University did a study in the last couple of years about um, post-secondary aspirations. And when we talk about post-secondary education, you know, that can be training program, certificate, you know, <coughs> advanced degrees, whatnot. But um, health care is very heavy on requiring post-secondary um, training and requirements. And what we see is that the aspirations are not necessarily um, there. So the, it gets complicated when you're trying to increase aspirations for post-secondary. Really, your focus is healthcare. How do you kind of marry those? And I think that's one of the challenges and why David's saying this is going to require, you know, a multi-sectoral approach to solve it. And the Act 48 recognized, you know, the fact that an involved, uh, involvement in this effort needs to include the pre-kindergarten through 16 year of education council and, and uh, being an active participant in the in the group that uh, helps us look at this. So these are the major concepts. I want to talk about the proposed activities to get there in the timeline, um, but I want to just pause for a moment. You, I think you've heard where we're focusing, this concept of reform of the pipeline, how we're creating um, and creating opportunities in terms of a healthcare workforce. So I'm, you know, intrigued about how over 10 years the primary care to population ratios remain pretty constant compared to the specialty to population ratio which has risen mm -hmm. pretty dramatically. Yeah. I want to add something into that also which is you see um, the culture of new physicians changing. The way that the physician full-time equivalencies were calculated is 40 hours. Now, if you uh, work 60 hours, you're still one FTE. And um, so I think that maybe in 2000, we might have been undercounting the workforce because we stopped at 40 hours. And now I think what we're seeing is that there's a tendency towards physicians wanting to have you know, more regular lives, not to have so much overtime. And so I think that it actually might misrepresent that we're having a decrease because we never counted that, that increase. There's another uh, aspect to it. I'm not quite sure how to connect it to what you're telling us right now. But there's been a lot of stuff in the press lately about physicians leaving Vermont if we go to single payer. Um, how do you start to think about that today? I'm not sure if that's really in <laughs> some of our purview in terms of how to make the environment better. We can certainly. Um, help make recommendations around developing a workforce. Some of the pieces of Act for the, um, the legislation does talk about um, uh, prior authorizations. You know, certainly there would be a number of issues that people would mention, prior authorizations, better reimbursement, but I'm not sure that when we look at the core of what we're to develop. Well, except that's, you know, speaking to the broader systemic issues and where we're, we need to go to in, in, in a reform system, which is different than previous workforce efforts, um, one of the things Act 48 does call for is looking at what factors either help you retain or, you know, lose physicians. <laughs> and, you know, that should now certainly be a key component of that. So we'll be looking at I mean, I hear anecdotal stuff like that, too. And that is uh, it, right. it's totally anecdotal. Right. I also hear, you know, I also hear there's 200 but physicians also, can't wait to move here, you know. But, so. it, but it's also specific. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good. That's a good factor to include in the. What I would see system. from in the report is, you know, is a, a, a series of obviously, what, if we're talking about some type of educational pipeline reform, that's long term. We've got to have some long term right. approaches, some short term. Again, I want to underscore the, all of the work that folks like the um, AHEC has done, that the hospitals have done, that employers have done to continue to train. Those do need to continue, particularly for the short term. And I think um, we need to have those as part of our recommendations. And we need to um, call out at the very least, what are those barriers to continuing to grow this workforce, not to um, lose them to attrition. We may not be able to create the solutions, but we definitely need to call them out and perhaps talk about who owns those particular, you know, those, those agree to how close you can get to that issue will serve you well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to Alan's point, you know, you're right, Alan, the increase in, in specialists over primary care. Um, I think I read, a, I read a study that said in 1990, 75% of internal medicine residents went into general internal medicine, and now it's 10%. So subspecialty is the... So you talked about the FTE counting. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to be counting FTEs for all the various health professional categories? Are you relying on Department of Health information for it, or just get a sense of how you're going to go about that since it looks like it may have been done in inadequately in the past? I think, um, well, I think it's, a, a, to say it inadequately, I think that um, the Department of Health has great insight as to what is happening. Mm -hmm. It's the, really the standard that they adhere to to be able to compare across states, so that the okay. FTE calculation isn't necessarily incorrect, it's okay. a standard. Um, I think, you know, what our job is in terms of looking at the data is to be able to justify and underscore that we've got a problem and that there's some specific targeted areas that we can improve. Uh, and again, staying away from the weeds um, of the profession by profession um, issues. So for example, if you're talking about secondary education, are you creating career pathways within our secondary education system where you can have health as a career pathway? Are you creating opportunities for students to, um, uh, to uh, be enrolled in both a technical and a general high school so that they can get their nursing assistance program? In? And those, those segregations currently occur. So I think it's more the systems-based, uh, and I think at the secondary level, you have flexibility to overlay um, for the short-term projections, you know, if we have, uh, for example, short-term, we know that we'll be short on nurses, change those, those systems, change the exposure during secondary education. I think where you get into a um, more difficult situation is when you look at post-secondary, the flexibility to train more or less nurses, physicians, um, social workers gets less. We can produce a lot of high school students who are interested in healthcare, promoting math and science, and it's transferable to other degrees. But when you get to the post-secondary, I think that's another one of your challenges is the flexibility. You know, we don't want to say we're going to ramp up on nursing and then all of a sudden we do, you know, we're producing too many and we've built an infrastructure that you, know, you, you can't keep dismantling and building it. Does that make some sense? So kind of along the same lines as Khan, when you see, um, I'm just wondering how you view or how you analyze or how you perceive um, when like Southwestern, um, their docs become part of Dartmouth-Hitchcock and then they lease them back and what does that mean for our state and how does that affect your view of the workforce? Um, I'm not familiar with it, I'm not sure. Uh, what is it, what's the reverber reverberations of it? I mean, what? You mean, what's my perception mm -hmm. of that? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That's what I was, you know, hoping you'd, you know, look, I'm looking for any insight on it. I'm not sure what the, you know, sustainable competitive advantages of it or the, you know. They, what prob they probably see it as a retention tool, but, you know, how effective that is. That yeah. We, that's a good point. Yeah, I think that we can take a look at um, a lot of the things that may, and I don't want to, um, uh, uh, forgive me for the way that I'm saying it, bite around the edges. You know, a lot of these retention or recruitment tools are very important, and again, I think that we can call them out, but in the absence of, and again, forgive me, more bodies, I think that those pieces won't make as much of a difference. If, we're, if we've got more 
healthcare providers, I think we're going to have more room for um, the mistakes or the bad models, perhaps, and then we can start addressing those. But um, I think we want to try to not bite around the edges of things that might not. I mean, all of this, I think, is a reaction. You, there's various models that are happening. That's one example. Rutland area is another where the hospital basically, the, the primary care services, 87% are being provided by federally qualified health centers in concert with the hospital, you know, um, a collaboration effort and, and, and some community benefit grant to support that. There's Springfield model, which converted to an FQHC. Gee, how come I came up with FQHCs? I don't know. Um, <laughs> <You're obsessed>. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but um, I mean, there are, uh, that would be interesting to see, and the effectiveness of any of those would be. And will your report look at those kinds of, uh, you know, sort of employment structural relationships and whether they're having any impact, or is that outside of, it, do you it, see that as outside of your purview? I think this discussion is about what your expectations yeah, are, so if that's, that's what you're that's looking a, for. That, that may be very important. To the extent that you can get into it, I think yeah. it would be worthwhile. Richard had some comment on it. I just wanted to ask you, so That's if the doctor is employed by Garment, yeah. but leased back to Southwest Medical Center, would they be counted <coughs> as practicing in Vermont? Yeah, they would have a Vermont license. Uh, I mean, according to the licensing survey, they have a Vermont license, and they're asked how many the hours of patient care they provide in Vermont. So that would be true of the Dartmouth physicians of yeah. Lebanon as well. So yeah, I think the system is very good at counting. They, they folks do capture that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's very good. That's, a, that's what I was wondering. That's kind of the basis of my I question. See. I wasn't <clears> sure. <throat> I, I, I'm not sure how it's all going to work out on the ground, but then there's how you. Um, you know how you manage it and, and how you analyze it and how you count it you know I mean it's a change so you're looking for some best practices as it relates to management or results well I think that the average person you know thinks that when you go to the hospital the doctors work for that hospital mm -hmm. I, I mean I don't know if the average person would think when you go to Southwest that the doctor works for a New Hampshire hospital mm -hmm. the question is would they care <laughs> so well, you why see. I don't know if they would care as long as there's enough doctors. Right. I don't know that they would care if there was ever a time when there weren't enough doctors, <coughs> and I was in charge at Dartmouth. I don't know that I'd let the doctors that I'm in charge of not be where I wanted them to be. Right. I mean. I guess what I'd be more interested in is the what are the models that people are trying to use to stabilize the workforce they have, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and why. And why and what's the experience without getting too far afield I mean you could go a long way on that so but magnet hospitals were one big thing that yeah worked at a while or ago. the the FQHC right. model or yep. various forms of mm -hmm. uh, employment that we're seeing around the state are those um, do we have any way of judging what's successful and what's not mm -hmm. and the um, the whole idea of um, all these the models, if you will. Um, Vermont's, I think, in a little different place than most other places as we move toward the second phase. Uh, so as close as you can get to that, the more useful, I think, and helpful it'll be. Yeah, I, you know, when I hear, hear you use the term call out, that to me means that in the strategic plan there will be suggestions, recommendations, or even expectations for our institutions, whether they be academic or clinical institutions, to get on board with this strategic plan, right? And I think beyond that, one of the things in Act 40 talks about looking at what national efforts are underway. And, you know, um, uh, the National Health Service Corps is, uh, has had a major expansion. It's about triple the size it was uh, two or three years ago. That can have a, a huge impact here. Um, but uh, it, the criteria by which physicians are placed works against a Vermont uh, because of, the, you know, that's something that we can make some recommendations yeah, about in terms national, of influence right, yeah some national. Um, but the the interesting thing is that with the expansion it, it has it money has an effect um, there has been an uptick and then I mean it's not a major shift but there has been an uptick in the 
uh, number of uh, medical students choosing family practice residencies in the last couple of years of American students at it. So. Yeah, I was a National Service Corps scholar. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to make clear, you know, I think when we talk about magnet hospitals, when we talk about, you know, Gold Star nursing programs, it, this does often, I think, when you look at employment models, they go profession by profession. And so I can pull those up. I think it's just the cautionary component of what are the systemic you know, things that we can do that are going to make an impact versus, you know, kind of um, looking at such a multifaceted, you know, approach profession by profession, which may change. But uh, we can certainly inventory those and talk about them, and maybe they, we can talk about implementing them as we see short-term projections changing to try to improve, you know, what's happening on the ground. Um, but I think, you know, we want to continue to bring it back to something that is very strategic, um, maybe yeah. difficult to implement, but everyone's <coughs> clear on what are we trying to accomplish. So yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get at is where there are models that seem to be working on right. the ground in Vermont now, where people have taken steps to either expand or stabilize the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, where are those working? What are they like? Why are they working? Mm -hmm. What's the practitioner experience? in those models sort of what do you what do you gain what do you give up yeah and again that you know you could do years worth of work on that but some um, treatment of that I think would be very helpful because it is something you know we hear that roughly two-thirds of the physicians in the, of the physicians in the state are now employed um, are they all employed the same way what's the what's the differences in terms of uh, the arrangements they're under um, what are the what's the good stuff, what's the bad stuff, and all that. Um, is that really working to stabilize, for example, primary care? Because that's a lot of the reason we hear yeah. that hospitals and physicians are, are going yeah, into the these arrangements. Like the hospitalist right. efforts. Like, do they get retained longer when they're employed? Mm -hmm. Is the turnover less than what it had been before they were employed? So I think it might help um, me, and maybe this is with the advisory committee, to select yeah. a few professions, because I think it will be profession by profession. Maybe yeah. it's around what blueprint community staffing looks like. Right. To start there and at least say, okay, of these five professions, what is working in Vermont? And mm -hmm. hopefully, as we examine those, there'll be some thread of commonality that we can pull out of it that we might be able to apply yeah. to other professions as well. Okay. okay. We haven't let you get all the way through yet, have we? Uh, the next is like how, you, how we're going to do it. I'm not sure you care as much about what's going to happen. But, um, project initiation meeting. We're meeting uh, in May with the Workforce Development Partnership. Literature and secondary source review. Again, a lot has been done. We need to focus our ideas and our activities. All of the work that's been done so far is really, you know, a very, very broad um, swipe. We're looking at workforce development, the recruitment and retention components of it. Um, and what's going to make the significant impact. Inventory of existing programs, and I think that's in line with what we just talked about, expanding it to look at um, models of retaining uh, professionals. Interviews with and involvement of key stakeholders. Uh, you know, this was originally interviews, but I'm thinking if we're talking about, for example, changing the secondary education pipeline, we've got to have working groups that involve high-level folks of the Department of Education. I know they're interested in reform within education. We've got to figure out, is this is healthcare the model they can start looking at to leverage their own reform? And, um, and we need high-level buy-in. So it's yeah, going to be interviews as well as, I think, small group involvement to create these recommendations. And Robin's good office is that it's going to get us uh, contact with the commissioners at the Department of Health and Labor and Education mm -hmm. so to stress why this is so important for their future as well. Um, developing a draft report, revising the draft report. Um, I, as I understand, there should be a public comment period and then drafting the final report. It's just a quick overview. Project initiation will be in May, literature review June, inventory July. A lot of these, you know, it's not um, quite so clean that they'll occur a month late. I think in particular <laughs> interviews. You know what that's like. Interviews and involvement. I think we actually need to, uh, this was done before we started thinking about small groups of high level folks within departments. Those have got to start soon and they need to occur across using the Workforce Development Partnership as a sounding board um, for what's happening. Draft recommendations, um, September, draft report back to you by November, 
and then a final report by December so that we can submit in January. It's ambitious. Um, and I think my concern is not so much the content but process and making sure that folks are actually on board. Again, um, health, education, labor, talking about some wide sweeping changes that they need to collaborate on is gonna be difficult, I think, to agree what those might be. So process, I think, is really the key. Essential given the scope of the economy that's consumed <laughs> by healthcare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and process without getting bogged down in the process, that's the key. Yes. He's good at outcome. <laughs> I have. Any other questions or comments? So do you um, see a time that you would feel a need to come back to the board before you presented us with a, with a draft? Or if, uh, you know, individual board members like yourself would, were interested in, you know, if it being a touchstone for us, that would be helpful too. I'd be happy to. Yeah, I think the He's biggest issue workforce. is making sure we're delivering, <laughs> we're delivering what, you know, I don't want any surprises. Right. I don't like surprises. So no one should be surprised when this comes out and it should look and feel the way that you're right. expecting it to. And those are my goals. And you know, I'll, I'll divest from what the actual content is if we can accomplish those. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Um, I just wanted to make a comment. I'm not sure if you're aware, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation did a huge um, lit review last fall, came out in October, they did a webinar. It's a nice solid 150 okay. page document. Um, might be a good resource for you. Thank you. It's a so, good read. So were we boring? <laughs> Uh, Al just yawned, but I don't oh. know. <laughs> you can point to sides of the thing. They said the magic thing, school. <laughs> four, four, four out of five ain't bad. Yeah. Uh, you're okay. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you very you. much. We look forward to hearing more from you. This is a quick statement. The mic has a statement. Well, new, reminder. New business. new business. Okay. Under new business. Um, We'll go to Mike for his statement. Sure. We, um, <laughs> this sounds ominous. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's not that ominous. No, you, all, you, all, you all know. Uh, we received our first recommendation for approval of a health insurance rate. It was the Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, third quarter 2012 medical trend filing. We received that recommendation from uh, the department yesterday, which triggers. A, uh, Yesterday? Today's Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Um, which triggers a 10 business day window for the board to uh, approve or disapprove that um, recommendation. The board has set a hearing date of next Wednesday, April 25th, and uh, the hearing notice and the materials that we received from the department are available on the rate review section of the board's website. And do we know yet whether there will actually be a hearing? We do not. Okay. Somebody has to actually ask for one, right? No. The, the, no, the, the, parties, have ha one. the parties have the, the option to... Waive it. Yes. It's an opt-out, not an opt-in. Opt-out, not opt-in. Okay, got it. We're new to this business. Um, so at this point, I would ask the indulgence of my other board members to um, hear for a few minutes from a friend of mine who walked in the room. I didn't realize he was going to show up this early, or I would have actually put this on the agenda. But my friend Mark Gibson, good old friend from Oregon, is here. Um, Mark runs something called the DERP. Do you know what it stands for? <laughs> the drug, I just asked him. The Drug Effectiveness <laughs> Review Program, which is at, uh, it's at OHSU, right? Uh-huh. Um, and then there's also the MED, which I've already forgotten what that stands for. Medicaid Evidence-Based Decisions Thank Project. Um, this is a multi-state collaborative among um, state Medicaid agencies, and perhaps it even goes beyond that, um, to provide a sort of central resource for clinical effectiveness uh, review. And um, so Mark is here in town, uh, and when I saw him walk in the room, I thought there are many people in this room who probably would appreciate a few minutes of uh, education about what they do. It's uh, happy to do it. Um, Madam Chair, I um, apologize for my casual dress. I didn't expect a speaking role today. I oh, God. I was here to witness <laughs> You're history. You're in Vermont, Mark. I would have been fine in Oregon. I know the rules there, but... Uh, yeah, your governor wears uh, jeans, okay. so... Okay. Um, Our governor wears nothing, apparently. <laughs> he wasn't by any chance in a Portland airport yesterday. No, I, heard <laughs> I heard about that. Yeah. I missed that on the way out yesterday. Yeah. It sounded like quite a show. Thomas, <laughs> did you get all that? <laughs> yeah, <are> you? <laughs> got it twice, Way to go, Sam. <laughs> uh, uh, 
members of the com uh, committee, my name is Mark Gibson. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Evidence-Based Policy, which is a freestanding center in the School of Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. My background is policy, um, not clinical work. In um, the ancient past, I was a firefighter and a paramedic, which got me into health policy indirectly when I became staff to the Senate president, and I was the only person on staff who knew there were four chambers in the human heart, and <laughs> therefore the health um, issues fell to me. Um, and that was back uh, in, the, in the ancient days when uh, we were creating the Oregon Health Plan and some other health care initiatives uh, out in Oregon that um, achieved some notoriety. Um, long story short, um, <clears throat> the Center for Evidence-Based Policy um, has as its mission uh, addressing policy challenges through evidence and collaboration. So what we have there is a real dedication to working with policymakers and starting with policymakers and decision makers in health um, and using their questions as the springboard for the work we do, the questions they need answered. Um, we seek to bring the best available uh, research evidence to policymakers uh, to inform their policymaking decisions. And uh, we also believe that collaboration is essential because resources are always limited, especially in the public sector. And um, we uh, seek ways for state policymakers primarily to leverage their resources so that they can actually get uh, better uh, research evidence to inform their decisions than they might otherwise be able to afford on their own. Uh, Anya mentioned two multi-state collaborations that we um, uh, we staff, <clears throat> we essentially do the organizational work around these uh, collaborations, but they are self-governed. That is, the state policymakers that participate through a subscription are the people who set the budgets, determine the research agenda, and, um, and essentially tell us what uh, we need to do. We execute contracts for them, we do research for them as assigned by the policymakers, or we um, contract out for research if we don't have the expertise uh, within our own center. We've all, in the, uh, <clears throat> uh, just a brief description of the two multi-state collaborations. The first one has to do with uh, comparative effectiveness of drugs within classes, essentially. So um, we will, uh, for example, review all of the clinical research literature avail globally available. Uh, generally, we limit it to English language because we don't have anybody that um, <clears throat> speaks Croatian in our um, and our staff, but uh, we look at the global research literature around a, a class of drugs, so take statins for an example, cholesterol-lowering drugs. We, um, we review all the clinical literature that's available. We critically appraise that literature to find what is good quality and what is not. Uh, and then we synthesize the good quality literature so that state Medicaid programs can use that information in their purchasing of uh, pharmaceuticals. So essentially then the states can say, okay, um, it's truly a class effect in this particular class of drugs. We can compete on price. We can ask the industry to compete on price and have confidence that we're still getting good health outcomes. Um, there may be a situation in which we'll be looking at one class and there may be an agent uh, that has um, a, uh, a much worse adverse event profile. So um, <clears throat> the glitazones for uh, treatment of of uh, diabetes are a great example of that uh, recently. And now we're seeing that one of uh, this class of drugs actually has a much higher uh, adverse event profile, and that is useful to um, the programs as they think about uh, how they want to structure their purchasing uh, of medications. Generally, the states come to us through Medicaid because they can, they can uh, they establish a partnership with the federal government. The federal government helps pay this subscription. Um, to the program, uh, but then they actually uh, are typically now disseminating that information out to many more agencies. So um, <clears throat> public employee health benefits agencies are now using the information, corrections, health programs, workers' compensation in some states um, use the information as well. So not only are there collaborations in this among states, but there are collaborations that have grown up within states among agencies to uh, utilize some of that information. Medicaid Evidence-Based Decisions Project essentially goes to um, reviewing the evidence on um, pretty much everything besides drugs. So um, 
durable medical equipment, devices, procedures, um, um, you know, all, uh, dental services, um, right, just right on down the line. So um, if it isn't comparing one drug to another, then the states in the uh, Medicaid Evidence-Based Decisions Project utilize our Center for Research to inform decisions around um, how they should structure their benefit package, what should be included in a particular coverage decision, and so on, um, and on uh, all the other um, all the other coverage decisions that they actually need to make um, on a routine basis in a Medicaid program. And is Vermont now subscribed? Uh, Vermont has shown interest in being a member. Um, we haven't executed a contract yet, but I think uh, the budget process this time around was, uh, that was one of the requests that went in, and, and uh, we'll, we're anxiously waiting to hear. We think it would be terrific to have um, Vermont. I think the, one of the things about collaborations um, is that <clears throat> the folks that collaborate get something out of the collaboration, but they also bring something to the collaboration. And to have the Vermont perspective at the table in these collaborations, I think, would improve them enormously. Um, and so we look forward to it in, in a couple of different ways. One is uh, leveraging the states look forward to it. Uh, the other states that are in this look forward to it because there are additional resources to leverage in terms of getting the research that they really need. Um, and they also look forward to having um, a participation from the officials in Vermont. And if we were to be subscribed, um, as another agency, I mean, that would happen through our Medicaid agency. Could we, for example, you talked about reviews of durable medical equipment, and I automatically think of Richard doing work. Richard's our director of payment reform, and he's working on um, bundled payment initiatives, for example, uh, and um, clinical guidelines becomes part of that. Um, would the work that you've done be available to us to use in that if we were subscribed as a state? Right. As long as you have a good relationship. If Medicaid's the one that signs up, if you have Mark a good relationship with the Medicaid say. folks, yeah. nope. <laughs> you're in like Flint. Okay. We, uh, you know, the, uh, the states when they join um, have access to, to the, the information that's produced for use in any way that they see fit. <laughs> I, I will say there's there are two, one other small distinction that I should put on the record. One is uh, in the Drug Effectiveness Review Project, the information has been part of the public domain from the very beginning. In the Medicaid Evidence-Based Decisions Project, the participants um, have decided to keep some of that information uh, proprietary. So there are some limits in terms of dissemination, not within the state. The state, once it's once it's uh, you know once it's in, the state has the ability to share within uh, within the state. Uh, but in just in terms of sort of publishing things on the internet and so on and so forth, it's it's more constrained on the on the med side. You learned from the newspaper industry. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. There is a free rider problem uh, yeah. that comes up in this, and if you put these things in the public domain, uh, you know, we I can't tell you how many times people said, "Oh, you're with Dirt Man. We use those reports all the time. They're terrific." <laughs> and I remind them that they aren't members, and they go, "Oh yes, but we have a budget crisis." <laughs> But so, which is real. I, I'm not. I don't mean to disparage that. But I, it uh, it is a there is a, a bit of a free rider issue, and the participants recognizing that set those policies, and um, and uh, so we we follow their direction. Alan, how um, how engaged and accepting are your physician providers and in, in the process? And let me give you two examples. It's one thing about we're talking about statins. Mm -hmm. But it's a whole other issue when we're talking about cancer chemotherapy sure. drugs, where the efficacy of a, in, for treating a given cancer wi within a group of drugs may be equal. One drug may cost eight hundred dollars, another must, might yep. cost eighty, yep. and that oncologist is going is going to get a cut on that. So, how, tell me how engaged your providers are in the process, and how tolerant and accepting they are. That's question number one. Number two is. How do you negotiate with a pharmaceutical company on price within a class? How exactly does that? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great question. So first, to the acceptance from uh, the clinicians, uh, that really varies from state to state. And let me just give you, a, I mean, a little idea of the spread. So it goes from New York to Oregon, to Arkansas to Alabama to Missouri, Minnesota, and so on. And so each of those states has, you know, has a different, um, uh, a, a different um, 
uh, ethic or culture around acceptance of these things. And um, in most cases, I think, um, it's safe to say that uh, clinicians in the states understand the cost pressure that Medicaid is under. Uh, if they um, are convinced that the research evidence is high quality that's being used and something and that things aren't just being foist upon them in an arbitrary way, um, then uh, they, they may not, uh, may not, the other thing is they're used to working with formularies and preferred drug lists at this point in time and so knowing that Medicaid just isn't doing something in an arbitrary way but is really using the evidence I think gives them the ability then to say okay I can work with that. Um, interestingly most states um, have <clears throat> some policies that exempt oncology drugs from, uh, from uh, you know, a preferred drug list or prior authorization sort of intervention. And so uh, that one tends to be a bit of an outlier and not, it's obviously very... Uh, is Oregon uh, exempt? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mental health drugs in some cases as well. Health, right. Yeah. Okay. right, right. Um, so uh, once again, the way in which the information is used to bargain with the industry uh, varies from state to state. Some states contract with a PBM and the PBM utilizes the clinical information. So the state will have a P&T committee. The P&T committee will select the agents that they want to have as preferred agents and then, or they'll say, this is a class effect, uh, go to the industry and get the lowest cost drug in that class. Um, other states, Washington for example, handles all that with I think about two staff people and they, and basically they have a closed bid process. So they sit down, they look at the information, and they say, okay, um, we're, this is a class effect, we're going to compete on price, give us your lo lowest, um, best price, and we'll open up the bids on X day, and the lowest cost um, group gets our business. So it varies. Uh, the work you do must be very hard because there are, there are pitifully few direct drug-to-drug -drug comparison trials the, since the pharmaceutical companies fund almost all of our research, our, pharmace, our drug research now, they really don't allow direct drug to drug comparisons within a class. How do you even come up with comparative effectiveness? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a, it's, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> in some cases where um, uh, the, the body of research is, um, uh, is particular of a, of a good enough quality um, we have done some indirect comparisons but we're really chary of that we, yeah. I mean the, the methodologies there are, are pretty scary and we just don't go down that road much um, so I guess the best way to say this is uh, in some cases it's very useful for the purchasers to understand where there isn't evidence of superiority because quite often <laughs> The picture they get from the marketing that's done is that there is a significant difference and so in some cases just knowing that there are no good quality studies that point up um, a superior medication in a class is sufficient for the policymakers to make their choice. I, I, I just add one other thing that I think one of the most interesting um, discussions that's a, that has arisen out of the conversations in these two projects has to do with the burden of proof. <coughs> that is, where does the burden of proof lie for covering, you, you know, for reaching, um, the, for getting over the bar for the state to cover uh, something? And uh, more and more, especially as resources get uh, scarcer and scarcer, the states are saying the burden of proof for our covering something lies not with us to prove that it doesn't work, but with those advocating its use to prove that it does. And so, if there's not, and so, you know, you see this trend in the pharmaceutical industry toward non inferiority trials and so on and so forth. You know, the policymakers say, well, if you're non inferior, that's good with us. Um, who's least expensive then? And so, so, I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's been iterative, it's been interesting, and I think the states are getting better and better at. Um, uh, at dealing with these things. I think the next big challenge, especially for the drug side, especially medications, the, uh, you know, the, the things that have low prevalence but high cost. Uh, and the Drug Effectiveness Review Project is now really uh, digging in to see how they, uh, how they can best um, inform decisions around that trend. 
Any questions from up here? Richard has one, of course. <laughs> I'm, uh, Richard, uh, I guess I have two questions now. Uh, one is, um, has the, have the commercial payers adopted your research and have you made any progress in, in standardizing formularies with, within the commercial market? And secondly, um, I, one of the questions we always get asked when a state regulation comes <coughs> into play sure. is, well, if I prescribe this drug and not that drug and it doesn't work, uh, what's my liability and how am I protected? Yeah, good. Uh, uh, the uh, the private um, uh, payers, uh, actually in Oregon, um, there is uh, an effort underway now to create a statewide formulary. So that, and it's, you know, one of the big issues there is a little additional price leverage and also uh, just cutting down on the hassle factor for clinicians that have eight different formularies they have to manage. Um, so, uh, you know, so there there's interest in doing that in Oregon. I'm not aware of anybody that has been able to do that yet, but if it could happen, it could happen in Oregon, it could happen in Vermont. Robin's going to do her right. best. Robin. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, it's interesting, you know, uh, one of the thing, one of the characteristics of our um, plural, plural pluralistic or fragmented, whichever end of that uh, <laughs> continuum you want to take in describing our healthcare system, is that <clears throat> uh, in some cases the private payers tend to see pharmaceuticals as a, an area where they, can, they think they can compete uh, and that they might be able to get a price advantage uh, you know, uh, for uh, their margins or their premiums. And so there has not been, um, you know, a broad-based uh, adoption. Now, that's not to say that they don't use the material that we produce. Um, and, you know, I've talked to any number of uh, private sector, they say, oh yeah, we're, we're all looking at the same stuff. Um, which in many cases <laughs> means we're all looking at your stuff, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm sorry, what was the second one again? The second one was if a, if a physician, well, again, yeah, someone in now restricted by the Medicaid yeah. formula. Okay. Yeah. But, um, administers or, or prescribes that right. drug and it's not effective, right. uh, that's the total potential of the loss. Right. Um, so um, I think it, it depends, once again, from state to state. In some states, uh, clinicians are indemnified against, um, you know, not, not providing, so in Oregon at least, um, I'll say one state that I'm, I know of, the practitioners in the Oregon Health Plan are indemnified against uh, anything that re results from them not providing something that's not paid for. So, you know, if you if it's not covered by Oregon Medicaid, you can't be, uh, yeah, you, so there's a safe harbor uh, created under state law. Um, uh, on the other hand, the other uh, thing that uh, is quite often done is that um, a step therapy approach will be taken in the, uh, in Medicaid. So. You know, for example, I think uh, antidepressants is probably a great example of that. Most states looked at the data and said, yes, there's very little difference among all these drugs in terms of expectation of efficacy. Um, there's differences in side effects, but we can't tell. There's no way to predict what side effect will hit whom, uh, all the rest of that. So they've, you know, what they've done then is they'll say, well, we're going to start off with the lowest cost drug, but we have step therapy available. So if it doesn't, if it's not efficacious, you can move forward. And typically they grandfather folks in. If they're stable on one medication, then they say, you know, we, we're not going to force somebody to change because when you've only got 30% efficacy, you've got a 70% chance of actually, you know, throwing that person out of um, out of uh, stable stability. So, uh, you know, there's a number of different ways. That it's, uh, yeah. Sure. All right. Any other questions from up here? For Mark? Mark, thank you for well, doing sure. this with thank no you, warning whatsoever. Yeah, that's my pleasure. It's very, uh, very part. helpful. Terrific. Oh, thanks for yeah. um, Thank you. And at this point, we are done with our formal agenda, but I'd take any questions or comments from the audience, starting with Ken. I had two. One for Ken, Ken, state your name Ken for Libertad. for Tom. <laughs> Thanks. I have two comments. One is specific to the pharmaceutical issue because I think, uh, having worked on this issue in, in 2009, Vermont passed an important piece of legislation which only began to uh, create some transparency in the relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and the medical profession. But I have to say that uh, if 
one is reforming our healthcare system, a whole lot more attention should go into the actual on the ground implementation of the use of medications. And I, re I refer back to a couple of weeks ago, I think Con Hogan asked a question about corrections and substance abuse. And I remember the day, it was about four years ago, five years ago, I had not been able to find out, for example, how many of our folks in the correction system were on uh, antipsychotic medications. Uh, it just wasn't shared. And um, at, at a particular moment, I announced that it was 50%. I made it up. <laughs> And the medical, director, fashion. the medical director at the state hospital said I was wrong. She said the answer is 45% of our inmates in corrections are on antipsychotic medications. We didn't even get down to the question of how much money that's costed, whether it's a slightly less expensive drug or more expensive drug. This is just a whole area. I just use that one vignette because all politics are local. So I just wanted to make that comment. The second is, is the broader question, I just appreciate having a uh, moment. I, I had an opportunity to, 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 to sit in on the payment reform <coughs> discussion and today's discussion, which is very interesting, but there always seems to be a, an elephant in the room sometimes when we're talking about the workforce. And I've always felt that it's so complicated that it's really good to be a simple-minded person. And so I would urge as part of that discussion to just take a look at incentives as it relates to actually knowing what it costs to run our system, which is another way of saying one of the great incentives is pay. And nobody ever wants to sort of say, what are we paying, the, the, let's say, hospital administrators in this state? You know, what are the top 15 administrators in each hospital receiving? Is this, is this part of the system we want to build on? Because it almost seems like that's the given, and I kind of question that. I also think if the same question is asked for people who do direct care, whether it's GPs, but even more so uh, social workers, was a good example. Um, we would have, you know, it may be very useful to have that information because you can build a thousand training programs. But if the pay is so inadequate, uh, I would argue that you're sort of building on a foundation of straw that will continue to, you know, be plagued by turnover and a lot of turmoil and in the end a big waste of money. So it's just a comment, but I never hear it said, we want to take a look at what are specialists getting in mm -hmm. different parts of the state? What are our administrators getting? What are our GPs or what are our mm -hmm. social workers or psychologists mm -hmm. making that become indicators as to how to create incentives that might build a certain type of system that you want to see? Good point, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Betty. I have one question and one comment. The Betty, state your name for. I'm Betty Keller. Thanks. Um, from St. Johnsbury. And um, so, some, one of you, I can't remember which, referred to um, a physician can choose between the more expensive drug and the less. And did it sound like they actually get a commission? Physician oh, actually. Yes, well, in oncology care, the delivery of uh, expensive chemotherapy, there is a. It used to be very high. It's a much lower percentage now that the oncologist gets of the cost of that. It's it's down under 10 percent now. But you know, in a fee in a fee for service, well, there's a deliver. There's an administration fee. There is an administration fee. You don't they that you when you go to the oncologist's office, there's a chemo bay, and they've got nurses monitoring five or six beds. So there's clearly a cost to, for them right. to administer a toxic drug. Right. So there right. has to be a way for them to recover that. It used to be very high, and it's been ratcheted down gradually over the last few years. Okay, but so. because of all the all the foundation needed with the sure. IVs and all that right. sort of thing, for like normal drugs, like a, a person buys and takes them out at home, they don't get any. No, no. Oh, okay. no. Thank you. Well, I don't know about it now. Most <laughs> you know, chemotherapy is going oral. I, I don't know what how that works. I really don't, I, you know, but it's, uh, it's actually it's when it's administered in a doctor's office. Yeah. Yet the same um, thing occurs with durable medical equipment usually right. as well. Yeah. Um, but if it's their standard seems to be though that if a patient can do it themselves, then that that fee is That's not right. It's the ability to administer uh, yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then my comment is related to what Ken just said, just to remind everybody that when there was a shortage, when there was a shortage of primary care in the UK. They made all the specialists and primary care physicians' salaries the same, and it got 
fixed. And I know that you can't do that suddenly in our system here. Did you hear that, board? They Solved. Probably, in the UK, they probably weren't as radically different, so it probably wasn't as huge of a change for them. And I recognize that we couldn't suddenly do that here, but I think that you know it does work. I was going to say, whose same did they use? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's also a matter of perspective, because the primary care docs are sitting there going, hey, we're going up. And yeah. the specialists are like, why are we going down? You know, you got to be careful. Well, then what we'll have is primary care cardiologists, primary uh, care yeah. neurologists, <laughs> primary care neurosurgeons. We actually went through that debate back in the night. Yeah. yeah. I, everyone, had somebody introduce themselves an yeah. Yeah. I had somebody introduce themselves to me in the 90s as a primary care pathologist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Betty. Any other comments or questions? Walter. I man. couldn't. GMC groupie here. I couldn't do that one. GMC <laughs> groupie. <laughs> uh, thank you, Walter. I needed that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Someone's got to be, you know, um, Peter Sterling's problem or, or talk. Catamount and VHAP, one of the, as someone that's been on both of them, and constantly fluctuating or trying to and trying to avoid it. One of the problems is that Catamount, v, Catamount's private insurance, plane denials, pre-approvals, and it gets to be really hellish. Another thing with the workforce development as a patient, one of the things I encountered was the constant problem of specialist doctor not being employed by the hospital but being contracted with the hospital to work. We never knew which was which or what was what and who would accept your insurance and who would not. Just too up. And I think that as a patient, that's a huge problem. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Yeah, it's Ben Richardson. Um, I, I, I think you brought it up, and I hope you do follow through on the cost uh, of care with an FQHC. We seem to think that it's it's less. I don't think anyone ever has truly honed in on the actual cost, because it's basically a cost plus operation. They have cost-based reimbursement, so they really have no an ins no incentive to restrict costs because if they lose money. The more money they lose, the more the feds give them. And I, and I truly think, I, I'm, I've been approaching it from the dental's aspect of, you know, what's the difference in rates with Medicaid when, when you throw in what the feds give them, they do a lot better than the private practitioners. And so there's a lot of people that drive pra past uh, private practitioners' offices to get to an FQHC because it's a subsidized care there, but we never see the true cost. So I hope you, that you, you look at that when you look at how you do it. I do. I do. <laughs> well, there have been innumerable studies. I think, I think where we err a lot of times is looking at the cost of an FQHC is look at the cost of a, of a single visit or what is paid for a single visit versus the cost to the system of a patient who util utilizes an FQHC over the cost of a patient that doesn't. There are innumerable studies that show that there's as much as a thousand dollar difference in the cost per care per year of a patient seen in an FQHC versus seen in a limited uh, setting. And it's been, I think That's one of the ways you'll see perhaps a little more transparency around this in terms of our work is um, as FQHCs get involved in payment reform, you know, the, the standards in terms of data reporting um, will be the same largely we'll across be. payment reform models and I think, you know, the sort of um, the it's test, hard to get that data, believe me. Yeah, but the the uh, the test of uh, you know can you provide high quality at lower cost? I think will will be applied to all of the models that we're uh, that we're piloting, and uh, and the FQHCs I, I want to make clear, to their credit, are very interested in participating in that work with us. So that's good. All right. Can I just add one thing? Yeah. <laughs> Not related to this conversation, actually. Speaking of data, Susan Garrett. By state primary care. We um, were just informed that in our UDS measures, which are of the data on our patients seen at FQHCs, we just added, which for this year, it was just added that we're going to look at um, employment turnover. So, to, to the work that the Act 48 Task Force is doing, I think right. that will be really valuable. Right. Yeah, which also gets to sort of the issue of what are you paying for? If you're paying more, what are you paying for? Right. Well, there may be some sort of value add there Absolutely. that we're not currently quantifying. Yeah. 
Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you guys for indulging me and having work. No, it's great. Yeah. Yeah.